Today we're going to prove this result within the topic of complex numbers. Now before I show you the solution, I thought I would kind of peel back the veil a little bit and give you a bit of insight into my thinking process because when I first looked at this question, uh, the solution didn't just sort of jump out at me. Some questions are very familiar, they're quite routine, it's like oh, I have an algorithm in my head for automatically how to do these. Um, and we like to call those, um, as math teachers, we like to call those exercises. It's like you know how to do this, you know what the steps are, you just go ahead and uh, sort of you know regurgitate your memory for how this process goes but alongside exercises where you know what the answer is or at least how to get there we also encounter these things called problems and problems are not so neat they aren't like oh here's the five steps that you go through every time you encounter uh, a question like this problems are much more interesting because the uh, solution path it doesn't immediately present yourself uh, itself to you or it might be just a little more unfamiliar. Now, doing those questions is really important because they help you actually think. Uh, it's when you do problems, it's when you attend problems that you actually have to consider different alternatives, different um, ways of solving the problem. And so as a result, you learn a lot more. Um, they hurt your brain a bit more, but they're a lot more beneficial. So what I wanna do is unpack for you a bit of the thinking process that happened to me before I actually arrived at my solution because that will show you, like the, the dead ends that I kind of went through um, were in fact not dead ends, they were a really important part of the logic I used to arrive at my actual solution. So uh, that's enough of a preamble, let's have a go at interpreting the question, understanding how to solve it. If Z1 and Z2 are complex num numbers such that uh, the modulus of Z1 equals the modulus of Z2, prove that, and then we have this result to do with the arguments of uh, apparently the product of Z1 and Z2, and then um, the square of the sum of Z1 and Z2. So how do we go about this? And the first thing that sort of came up to me was that this uh, result, this thing, this connection to do with the arguments, uh, it isn't always true. This is not uh, universally the case. It's true on a condition. And you can see the condition provided to you right in the start of the question. Uh, this is only true uh, if you've got this situation where the moduli of your, your two complex numbers that you're considering, Z1 and Z2, if the moduli are equal, then this is actually true. So I thought, well, a natural place to start is to uh, use this as kind of our foundation, our logical sort of basis, and then sort of develop from there. So the first thing that I wrote down was, well, Z1 equals Z2. <laughs> that's, that's the first piece of data they've given us. But then uh, I can consider Z1 and Z2 as complex numbers in a variety of different forms. We've got rectangular or Cartesian form, we've got polar or trigonometric form, and then we've got exponential form. And often one of the things that we want you to learn as you attempt these questions is that some forms are more helpful than others depending on the kind of question you're trying to solve. And so I thought to myself, well, which is the most useful of the forms for this particular question? When you have a look at the result that's being asked to be proven here, um, you can see it has arguments in it, and then the piece of information that you're provided with um, is to do with moduli. So therefore, I would think rectangular form, which tells me the horizontal and vertical coordinates for these complex numbers, will be less useful. I want a form of the complex numbers that has to do with uh, the modulus and the arguments. So that would either be polar trigonometric form, or exponential form. Now both of those are pretty closely related. Um, they both have the same piece of information written there. The modulus out the front as r and then um, the argument theta um, over in either the trigonometric terms or in the exponential uh, in the exponent, right? So because I'm a little bit lazy I decided to go with exponential form because it's slightly more concise. So this is what I wrote next. I said, well, if Z1 and Z2 are uh, two sort of arbitrary complex numbers and the only things I know about them is that they have the same distance from the origin, the same modulus, then I can say they both have this shared R, so they're equal. I don't have to say there's an R1 and an R2. I know from the outset that they're equal, um, but then I don't know anything about the angles. The angles could be anything. So I've just designated them alpha and beta it could be equal to any kind of angle. So then I started to consider, well, if this is my setup, this is how I'm framing Z1 and Z2, uh, how can I bring this toward the content of the question? Well, 
if, if this is my Z1 and this is my Z2, then I can actually fairly straightforwardly uh, evaluate the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this expression, and I'm hoping to get the same thing. So I start at the left-hand side because it's easier. When you multiply um, these two numbers together to get the arguments, um, this is just me taking r e to the i alpha and r e to the i beta and just multiplying them together, right? So you, of course, get your r's multiplying to give you r squared, and then if you remember your index laws, um, you can see that e i to the alpha, e i to the e to the i alpha and e to the i beta, um, both of them have the same base, so we can just add their indices together. So I'm getting this, r squared e to the power of i alpha plus i beta. Nothing too dramatic so far. Um, you can see at this point when you're working out the arguments, you want to uh, get the angle there um, by factorizing out i. That's how uh, we write the complex, the, for, the uh, polar, sorry, the, yeah, I'm so confused at the moment, the exponential form of a complex number. So we would say uh, once you've got it in r e to the i theta form, that theta, which is just whatever you get after you factorize out i, that's your angle, right? That's your argument. So therefore, I get from there to alpha plus beta, which probably you already saw from the outset, but this is just the working to get there, right? So this is the argument. This is what happens when you multiply uh, complex numbers together. You add their arguments. Now we have a look at the right-hand side of the equation, which is a little bit more complicated and see if we can get something meaningful out of it, right? So this is what happened to me. I just said, well, I'm just going to take the right-hand side as stated, and then I'm just going to substitute in my r e to the i alpha and my r e to the i beta. Uh, this is just a straight substitution, and then uh, I'm squaring it. So therefore, I can actually expand this binomial, and this is where I landed. Now, this was the point at which I thought to myself, okay, this is true, but it doesn't look especially useful to me because unlike you can see here with the left-hand side, right? Um, the left-hand side, your e to the i alpha and your e to the i beta, they collapse into a single e to the whatever term. And so you can read um, or you can extract the argument out of that quite, uh, quite easily, which is exactly what we did here. But, but you don't get away so easily here. I've got these r squareds hanging out the front. Sure, I could just factorize them out and everything will be fine. But then you've got this business happening. I don't really know what to do with this. You've got these different arguments of different complex numbers here, but they are connected via addition not by multiplication. Now, I don't have like a ready-made result like I do here, um, or indeed here, that when you multiply complex numbers, you add their arguments. Well, when you add complex numbers, that's what I'm doing here. There are three separate complex numbers here that came from this binomial expansion, and I'm not multiplying, I'm, I'm adding them together. What do you know about the argument of that sum of complex numbers? And the answer is, uh, I don't know. I don't have any ready-made results, like I said before, that will help me. So at this point, even though I feel like I got somewhere, I didn't get far enough. Um, I, don't, I don't see, um, sort of, it's not immediately apparent to me how I'm going to get this uh, into here. Um, if the question is true, which it is, by the way, um, I should be able to get there, but I, the path is kind of not immediately apparent. So it's a little bit like, I'm in a maze and I've sort of gone through a few different turns and then I haven't ended up at a dead end, but I've gotten to a point where I'm like, I don't know how to progress from here. So at this point I thought, hmm, I'm a little confused. What else could I do? What other problem solving strategies do I have in my toolbox? And I thought to myself, well, um, can I understand what is going on here by thinking of a specific example, right? Um, this is supposed to be true for any pair of complex numbers such that their moduli are the same. So can I think of a pair of complex numbers that have the same modulus, and then can I understand what does this actually mean? What does it look like for that example? Now, doing something by example is obviously not a proof. We want to show that this is true in a general sense, not just for a specific case. Um, but when you have a look at a specific case, as you're about to see, often that specific case can give you insights that will work generally, and that gives you kind of a path through the question. So let's have a think about um, some specific examples of this. This is the easiest example I could think of, of two complex numbers that are um, easy to wrap my head around, they have the same argument, and then to see what would the result mean. So I chose um, my first complex number to be 1 and my second complex number to be i, because then I can quite you know, easily work out well, what's the product, um, what's the sum, and then what happens when I square, right? So here's 1, 
Here's i, and of course the sum of 1 and i is 1 plus i. So you can see that's where it sits on the, uh, on the complex plane, right? And I should have uh, marked in that this is the imaginary axis. And this is the real axis. So, so far so good. Um, I've got my uh, 1 plus i, which I'm getting from here. And now you can see if I were to square this, uh, of course I could actually just use the uh, binomial expansion here and I could work out what it all ends up to be equal to. But I don't need to because the thing that I'm really interested in is just the argument, just the angle. Um, it's the argument of z1 plus z2 all squared that I need. And I know that because I've chosen nice and easy numbers, I've got an argument here of pi on 4. So when I multiply this 1 plus i by itself, uh, I'm going to add the argument to itself. So it's going to give me an argument of pi on 2. Uh, 1 plus i all squared is going to be off somewhere up here. Yeah, be something like that. From you know, just working it out, I think you're going to get two i. That's what happens when you uh, multiply the the one squared and the i squared cancel out, just leaving the, the two i in the middle. So you can see um, this is going to be the argument I get when I uh, add and then square, which is you know, by inspection, the same as the argument you're going to get when you multiply, right? Z1 times Z2, because I chose such easy values, that just gives you i, and i, of course, uh, it also has an argument of pi on 2. So it, it works, okay, but um, this is a very easy example. Can I, can I generalize further by looking at, you know, this is a, a very, you know, really convenient numbers, can I go further? And what I decided to do was not go too much further. Um, 1 and i are nice because they both sit on the unit circle. Um, I can consider other numbers on the unit circle. That means they'll have the same modulus, moduli. Um, but I can think of some more interesting and exotic examples. Not, it doesn't need to be much more exotic to see um, a bit of a point. So what I did was next I considered, uh, let's, let's keep i. That's, uh, you know, it's still simple but not too, too as simple as 1. Uh, and let's consider a number like minus 1 on root 2 minus one on root two i. Now, why did I choose that? Um, that's because I, I chose something which was often a different quadrant um, to see if I could understand what was going on. So when you draw this thing out, this is what you get, right? In fact, I can just delete this. What's going on here? Well, um, here's my z1 and here's my z2. And in order to work out what z1 plus z2 is, I'm thinking of these, think back to um, you know, the earlier topic uh, in, in complex numbers, I'm thinking about visualizing each of these complex numbers as a vector, right? So you can see here z1 can be considered as a vector from the origin up to i. So in other words, that's just a, a vertical translation of exactly one unit. That's how you get to i on the complex plane. So therefore to do z1 plus z2, I can say, well, it's like doing z2 and then adding z1, which is to go up one unit in the vertical direction on the complex plane. So you can see that's why I've marked in this blue dotted line as plus z1. That's me going upwards just like this plus z1 is doing. And um, that makes this result here z2 plus z1, strictly speaking, but addition is commutative so I can switch the order. So this is where my number is, okay? z1 plus z2. Now at this point I thought to myself, okay, I think I understand what is going on because um, I've got an angle here, if you think about this angle around here, this is the argument of z1 plus z2 and if I were to square z1 plus z2 it would go double the way around. So where is it going to end me? It's going to end around, um, if I do that angle all the way over again, I think it's going to end up here. Right? And you can see that is going to give you the same result as um, what would happen if you um, took this and you added uh, the argument for z1 because that's what happens when you multiply z1, z2, z1 times z2 you add the arguments. So I'm going to start from here and then I'm going to add the pi on 2 that you got here. So you can see this pi on 2 here I'm adding to here. So you can see it's just going forward a little bit. Um, and so you can see here the reason why this works is because this angle uh, for z1 plus z2 in the first place, do you see that it's exactly halfway between z1 and z2, there's actually a bisection of that angle happening. So in fact, and this is where the light bulb moment for me was, there's actually geometry underneath this. The reason why I wasn't able to get very far with this algebraic approach is because I'm trying to understand these um, angles and these lengths, uh, z1 and z2 being the same, uh, I'm trying to deal with them in strictly algebraic terms, which means I'm not thinking about what they mean geometrically. Um, it's possible 
but it can be quite hard and you can see it's quite finicky to do, it's why it didn't get very far, okay? Now, once I saw this, once I realized there was a bisection happening and that I could think about this geometrically, that's when the lights turned on for me and I finally arrived at not just some specific examples where this works, but an actual solution. So that's what I'm about to show you, but before I do that, I just want you to hit pause um, on this video. If you didn't think about doing this geometrically, hit pause before I show you the answer and see if you can have a go at what would you construct? How would you do this in general terms? Remember what you're looking at right now is all in terms of specific complex numbers like one and i or i and minus one on root two, minus one on root two i. This won't cut it for a proof that's general. How would you construct a diagram and then use some deductive logic, some geometric logic, to try and prove this true for any Z1 and Z2, so long as they share the same modulus? Have a think about that. I wonder if what I've shown you is enough of uh, a nudge, if there's enough clues, 